I've had this article sitting in my backlog for a while, and the reason why is because I don't know how to approach this article. The writer has a point about how video games cannot save the world yet, but even as someone who plays video games non-stop, the overall premise is absurd. The idea that video games are gonna save the world is the kind of idea that I expect to come out of a hyperdimension of Tunia fanfiction, but nope, here we are with this article talking about how video games cannot save the world yet. Actually, I don't have to go that far for reference. The writer thinks as if the world works like Ready Player One. I have never never seen such an overly optimistic mindset about video games, but hey, let's dive in to see what the writer wants to talk about. Five years ago, the future of video games seemed hopeful. A new wave of games whispered to players about their own lives. After decades of roaring power fantasies, the industry began to critically explore topics like identity, marginalization, mental health, and economic struggle. That's actually pretty interesting. Video games have truly evolved from mindless power fantasies of hunting demons from hell to mindless power fantasies of hunting demons from hell. In HD! But for real though, I assume that based on the characteristics that you mentioned, you're talking about the Persona series, Tales of Symphonia, Deadly Premonition, and Reseteer. All of those games do explore the topics that you talk about. It's very specific, but hey. Unsurprisingly, I was wrong. The paragraph referenced an article which talk about the games about identity, marginalization, mental health, and economic struggle refer to indie games like Gone Home and Papers, Please. What I find interesting about this article is that the title makes it as if video games in general never talked about issues of identity, marginalization, mental health, and economic struggle. The article is written in 2014, and the games that I mentioned were from 2007, 2010, 2003, and 2008. This is nothing new. One of the developers even have this to say. What's blocking interactive media from being considered art is that most video games focus on primitive feelings of aggressiveness and competitiveness, said Oliveira, 23, a lifelong gamer who graduated from USC's interactive media program last spring. <laughs> oh boy, so what's blocking video games from being art is video games being aggressive and competitive. In other words, Fun. The article is written by someone who hasn't played a lot of video games in their life. The writer said that the industry is tired of narratives built on men with guns. Writer, please tell me that you wrote this article in 1987. The article ends by stating that video games have yet to win broad appeal across age and gender lines in the same way that blockbuster films or top rated TV shows have. Yeah? So? They don't have to, they still make billions and billions of dollars more over films and TV, they're the most profitable entertainment industry ever. Going back to our very first paragraph that referenced the entire article, the writer cited an article talking about how video games tackled more issues than power fantasies of men with guns, with games that actually talk about the real issues like marginalization etc. In other words, replacing the power fantasy that most men have with the power fantasies of far left ideologues. The problem is, video games have talked about those issues before any of these indie games talk about those issues. You're not the part of the revolution, you're actually way too late to the party. Some use sharply designed game mechanics to represent the struggles of everyday life. Others bend their virtual worlds in surprising ways using digital architectural as allegory. Instead of focusing on space marines, superstar athletes, or avaricious entrepreneurs, games began looking at everyday people. Oh god, first off, if you're gonna talk about games that look at everyday people, you might want to take a look at the survival horror games. The writer cited a Guardian article talking about how video games have a diversity problem that runs deeper than race. The article is mostly talking about how mainstream popular games are taking over the industry's charts and driving creative people out of the industry because video games that they like with genres that they like are not popular. In other words, people don't buy creative games and instead keep on buying video games that appeal to the lowest common denominator. Welcome to the video game industry, writer. For the record, I have never played Fortnite, and that's the biggest game that everyone is playing. I have never played Mobile Legends, that's the most popular game that people play around my area. If you're pushed out of video games thanks to how the popular video games are not the type of games that you want to develop, or the type of games that you like, that tells me that you have zero passion in video games. If you gave up so easily because people prefer to play Fortnite than your walking simulators, maybe try to make games that actually cater to a specific market rather than making games that do nothing but jerk yourself off? While the bulk of these independent and alternative games did not find commercial success, and while many mainstream gamers rejected them in an act of fearful cultural gatekeeping, critics and previously underrepresented players received them as mana. Society has pined for games that reflected the complexity and diversity of the real world. Now we had them. 
Trust me, ladies and gentlemen, you don't want to click the article cited throughout the paragraph because you're gonna have a serious headache reading through it. The first article is about the gatekeepers of video games, in which the writer says, and I quote, Video game culture does not exist. Why did the writer say that? It's basically to tell those gamers who say that Facebook games are not games that their opinions are relevant. Nice try, writer, but they're not wrong. Oh, but don't worry, guys, it gets worse. The next article cited is closing the gap between queer and mainstream games, in which the writer says that she sobbed when she finished Gone Home. Don't worry! It gets worse! The next article cited is about how the writer feels so damn good being represented in Animal Crossing by having the main character to have a tan skin. Finally, Animal Crossing Senpai noticed this poor person of color who has to play as white people all the freaking time. This entire article is so self-serving and should have been put on a masturbation section at Pornhub. To put it short, gamers are wrong, video games should talk about issues that only I care about, and video game industry senpai, please notice me. All that I got from this entire article is nothing but narcissistic self-serving BS. And now we're getting into the main point of discussion. There was a shared belief that this moment proved that games could do more. This is what games could be, we seem to say. It wasn't just a good thing that more mature, experimental, and diverse games were making a splash. It was a blueprint for how gaming could help shape the broader cultural landscape. Games, the argument went, could save us. Save us... From what? The article that you cited mostly talk about how video games are gonna be a significant cultural influence and it can be used to talk about issues like how the price of gas in California affect the politics of the Middle East. Wow. Amazing idea. Absolute bestseller. I think you all need to be aware that video games are entertainment. They're made to appeal to their respective target demographic. If you're gonna make video games to talk about issues that you and only you care about, Who's going to buy them? It seems to me that ideologues don't understand that the video game market doesn't always revolve around them. People are not gonna buy video games that revolve around your issues because, let's face it, people don't care about your issues. To put it short, video games define modern culture because they are fun, not because they are preachy. While great writers like Yusef Cole, Hevra Alexandra, and Dia Lucina continue to tackle issues of representation, they also expanded their critiques beyond voicing a desire for fictional inclusion. Great writers. Okay, I want you to prepare yourself because I'm going to read the titles of all of the articles that the writer cited on all of those three great writers. Ready? Cuphead and the racist specter of Fleischer Animation. David Cage games keep treating women like crap. Shadow of the Tomb Raider tries but fails to tackle its own colonialism. All of these three articles by these three writers are praised by this writer in how they continue to tackle issues of representation and expand their critiques beyond voicing a desire for fictional inclusion. As if the desire for fictional inclusion isn't a pathetic enough motivation, the critiques from these writers are things that only far-left ideologues care. If you think that these criticisms are going to save video games, I'm sorry to inform you that you are wrong. They're not even criticisms, they're just screeching from far-left ideologies. History itself has also weighed in on our old optimism about the power of diverse art and social gaming. While it is reductive to claim that US President Donald Trump owes part of his success to Gamergate, the online campaign of hate that targeted women and other minority groups, white nationalist groups have been using gaming communities as recruitment pools, social media skills honed on gaming forums have become useful tools in the spread of propaganda and hate. I, I, I don't even know why I'm here. I don't know where to start with this paragraph. It's like if I'm reading a far left version of Alex Jones. I love that you talk about how people are spreading propaganda and hate when pretty much a lot of the articles that you cited did exactly that. You want to complain about people spreading propaganda and hate? Look in the mirror, buddy. To paraphrase a talk I gave earlier this year at the NYU Game Center, making good games isn't enough to make good in the world. Marginalized game designers spend time and money transforming their lived experiences and political concerns into art, only to have it ignored by the mainstream and belittled by the MAGA crowd. <laughs> you know what, I'm gonna read that entire paragraph except with a sad violin in the background. To paraphrase a talk I gave earlier this year at the NYU Game Center, making good games isn't enough to make good in the world. 
marginalized game designers spend time and money transforming their lived experiences and political concerns into art only to have it ignored by the mainstream and belittled by the MAGA crowd. The articles that you cited talk about casual games, smartphone games, walking simulators, basically artistic games that try to make a point about contemporary issues or more accurately talk about issues that the game developer cares about and only the game developer. So when you talk about marginalized game designers spending their time and money and transforming their live experiences and political concerns into art, you are talking about developers who make artistic games with little to no gameplay, but they have a point, they have a social commentary about issues that the developer cares about and no one else then you complain that this artistic self-serving game that you made are not only ignored by the mainstream but they're also belittled by the MAGA crowd so your self-serving masturbatory social issues artistic game with zero gameplay doesn't sell well and isn't really that popular what a shocking turn of event it's really fascinating to dive into the mindset of a far left ideologue this person insinuates that the people who belittle artistic games are Trump supporters you are so disconnected from reality, I am convinced that you are not human. Let me make this simple. If you make a video game that isn't fun and talks about serious issues that no one cares about, no one will buy your game. It's never going to be popular because people don't want ideology in a video game. They want fun. Do you understand that the video game industry doesn't revolve around you? Facing this politics of negativity, that is an ideology that is fundamentally about response and removal instead of the creation of new work, it's clearer than ever that Whatever their communal and personal value, good games will not save us. This is where things get really confusing. This is the end of the first section of the article, and it mostly talks about how video games have evolved from power fantasies to power fantasies for far-left ideologues. But this section is to highlight the point that good video games, or at least good video games according to the writer's ideological standards, are not enough to save us. Now let's answer the question that you might be wondering for the past couple of minutes. What is this lingering threat that video games are not going to save us from? Well, it's actually a lot of things. Gatekeeping gamers who think that Facebook games are not games, the MAGA crowds that criticize artistic video games, hateful right-wing terrorists, and finally the culture of crunch in video games? I want to know how the hell can the writer come into the conclusion that video games can save us from- Actually, wait a second, what does the writer mean by us? Who is us? Who is the writer referring to? Considering that the writer talks about how the MAGA crowd is one of the frats, I can safely assume that by us, the writer means far left ideologues. In that case, I can safely say no. Video games will not save you from all of those things. I want you to please tell me how video games can save you from all of those things. This of course is all idealistic thinking, but it's not the naive idealism of my younger self which hoped that smart technologies and great games could save us. This new utopian ideal isn't about achieving a single goal, but about the adoption of ethics. This outlook of the future will be achievable only by shifting fundamental elements of the games industry and creating frameworks that don't shift with corporate whims. This is a vision made up of real, tangible steps that we can take towards a more equitable world. Yes, you heard that right, the writer wants to achieve some sort of a utopia. Scared? Don't worry, it gets worse. To fulfill this potential though, we need to follow the example of the games we love and avoid a power fantasy mindset. A more positive future for gaming is not a guaranteed outcome, it will be the result of radical rewiring, social upheaval, and a confrontation of our own complacency. In other words, propaganda, indoctrination, social engineering, demonization, and shaming yourself for not following the far-left ideology. The only thing that's missing from this paragraph is hashtag resist. This entire article isn't about saving the gaming industry from whatever issues that plagued it. This article is about creating an ideal utopian environment for the far-left ideologues and how video games can't always help them from creating it. It's as if video games don't always revolve around them or something. 